Um, NVSL, as you know, is part of the National Centers for Animal Health. That is a virtual organization made up of three units, the National Animal Disease Center, the Center for Veterinary Biologics, and NVSL. It came about in 2009 when we moved into a new facility in Ames, and together the campus is known as the National Centers for Animal Health, or NCAH. A little bit about the NVSL structure. We're divided into four separate laboratories, virology, bacteriology, pathology, and then the foreign animal disease lab located on Plum Island. In Ames, there's about 270 employees, another 50 on Plum Island. We have about 32 VMOs and about 50 micros that work for us. Um, Beth Lautner is the director of NVSL. And also under her direction is the NALM coordination with Barb Martin as the NALM coordinator. A couple of uh, personnel changes to point out here. Tom Bunn la left the Diagnostic Bacteriology Lab after about 42 years of service, left some pretty big shoes to fill. Dr. Matt Erdman moved into that slot and he's doing a great job. He moved in from the bacterial identification section where um, you might have worked with him on the contagious equine metritis outbreak. He, he was head of that section almost uh, at the same time uh, the first uh, major CEM outbreak back a few years ago and he did a great job there. Um, Suli, Suli Rob Osterman has become section leader of mycobacteria and brucella section. She took over for Beth Harris, who moved up as chief of staff. So we have two Beths in the director's office just to keep us on our toes. Um, Samia Metwally left the foreign animal disease lab, the diagnostic services section, where she was head. She went to work for FAO. And we brought in uh, Dr. Fernando Valiz, uh, Torres Valiz. He moved from the reagent section at FADL, and we filled that reagent section with Dr. Wei Jia, who's relatively new in that position. And the other red boxes are just a little bit of internal shuffling that we did, uh, moving people around. And so our mission is to basically to uh, safeguard U.S. animal health and contribute to public health through diagnostic support. Diagnostics is the bread and butter at NVSL. We uh, do it as a day-to-day -day activity. We did last year about 67,000 accessions, reported out over half a million test results. Okay. In addition to the diagnostic testing, we have about 500 different tests listed that we can do. About two-thirds of them right now are ISO 17025 accredited. Our goal is to get about 80% of them ISO accredited in the next couple of years. We also supply reference, references and reagents. We have, again, about 500 different reagents, mostly for sale from NVSL listed in our catalog. We provide training, not only foreign animal disease training at FADL, but also uh, in Ames we do uh, equine uh, infectious anemia training, CEM training, lepto training, various tra training sessions. We conduct proficiency testing of other labs. We have about 30 proficiency panels available. We provide subject matter experts. We do developmental work, mostly targeted on diagnostics. Um, the National Animal Disease Center is more heavily focused, focused in research. We just do research based on diagnostics. We are uh, OIE Collaborating Center, an OIE Reference Lab for the 12 diseases listed there, and an FAO Reference Center as well. So now I'm going to focus on DVL and get into a little bit about Schmallenberg. Um, Dr. Bev Schmitz, the director of the Diagnostic Virology Lab, Sabrina Swenson is head of bovine porcine and aqu aquaculture. The avian section head is vacant currently. We've advertised that a couple times, have been unable to fill it. It'll probably be advertised again in the near future. Dr. Ostland is head of the equine ovine section. She is our expert in Schmallenberg. I am not. I'm get on the record right now for that. Um, Eileen has done a lot of work with Blue Tongue and West Nile, 
and, and she's been very actively engaged in getting our diagnostics up and running for Schmollenberg. She's been in contact for several months with the German lab, the Frederick uh, Loeffler Institute, and they've been very, very cooperative to give us viruses, protocols, reagents that we need to get our diagnostics up and running. So a little bit of back, background on Schmollenberg, you probably already know this. There are some fact sheets that uh, I think Dr. Kindi has made um, copies for you if you're interested. Um, Schmollenberg was first seen in Germany in August of last year. It affects primarily sheep, goats, cattle, and possibly other ruminants. Um, it was first noticed in dairy cattle where the herds were going off feed, maybe some transient fevers, diarrhea, kind of a quick hitting syndrome that came and went without a whole lot of impact. But then later in the fall, in November, they started to see uh, congenital defects in, in abortions, especially in the sheep where high numbers uh, in the flock can be affected. Um, right now, there's about 2,100 premises affected, 85% are sheep, about 10% cattle, and the rest goats. It's spread through about eight countries in Europe and uh, it has become fairly widespread. The Frederick Loeffler Institute did the diagnostic workup on, on this virus. They isolated an orthobunia virus. It's similar to other resembles Akabani, not considered at this time to be a risk by CDC, and there is no vaccine, but I'm sure there's many vaccine companies that are actively trying to get one as fast as they can. It's, the disease is transmitted by Pulicoides midges. Um, they did some testing in Europe, and they tested midges that they had collected back last fall. They were positive, and they were positive not only um, from, from the, the blood meal in them, but specifically from the heads of the midges. So they believe that that shows that they're competent vectors where the virus ap actively replicates. Our entomologists have told us that the U.S. has competent vectors that will be able to transmit this disease if it shows up in the U.S. There have been no reports of Schmollenberg in the U.S. at this time. NVSL has been doing some foreign animal disease diagnostic case workups from, especially from sheep that have had high numbers of abortions. To date, none, none have been confirmed to Schmollenberg. APHIS has increased some uh, restrictions on imports from the EU to try to keep this virus out. And um, USDA uh, SIA up the road has developed these case definition and guidance documents, which are really quite uh, complete and thorough, have a nice list of references. They're available. They went out to all the state animal health and federal animal health people on Friday from <coughs> John Clifford. And there's going to be a call tomorrow at, I think it's 1 o'clock Mountain Time, to kind of go over this guidance. And these fact sheets are also available on the APHIS website. NVSL is um, <coughs> currently actively diagnosing or is able to diagnose Schmollenberg. And we want, we've set up to try to do some passive surveillance for anybody who is interested. Either the cases can come as a foreign animal disease diagnostic investigation through the AVIC or state animal health vet, just like any other foreign animal disease investigation. Or alternatively, if the laboratories, diagnostic laboratories, are doing a workup and they suspect that it could possibly be Schmollenberg, they are invited to send those samples to NVSL and NVSL will rule out Schmollenberg and cash valve fever and there will be no charge at this time for that diagnostic work. You're asked to let your uh, animal health officials in the state know if, if you're sending samples to NBSL for the diagnosis. Um, so the case definition, when to submit, if you're, if you're wondering, 
Uh, the case definition is for ruminants where more than one dam has uh, congenital malformations uh, in in the or stillborns in lambs or calves. It's probably most likely going to be in in lambs. The differential should will not these will not be worked up at NBSL. So if you're going to do a differential, do it in your own labs. We will again only rule out Schmollenberg and Cache Valley fever. The samples that we would like are fetal brain, heart, blood, and serum, and from the dams only serum. And this is just how to submit. You use the regular 10-4 form and indicate it's for Schmollenberg. Be sure to let your state vet or and or AVIC know if you're sending anything forward. Any quick questions on Schmollenberg? That's all I have for Schmollenberg. Is that vector same vector from the blue column eight that went through Europe? I believe it is, and it also is following the same pattern that blue tongue eight went through Europe. I think our entomologists anywhere are fairly, it's the same genus and species of Keelacoides in Europe as we have here. I don't think the actual studies have been done at this time. Any ideas as to the possible source of this virus outside of Europe prior to August of 2011? It is uh, found in other parts of the world, but um, there's there's just speculation. I, I don't know of any definitive uh, hypotheses. So it's not an emerging disease as such since it has already been recognized? As it has been recognized in other parts of the world, yes, in Asia and Africa. Any ideas as to the duration of protective immunity following infection, first-time infection with the virus? No. I, I don't know of any studies or anything written on that. You would expect some his, somewhere in the history some genetic material or animals coming from Europe, right? I mean, it's not going to just come over on the wind or something like that, correct? Or is there any indicators of that? But it would be you would have to have some history of some kind of connection with Europe or Germany. I would say. Right, and if you look in the guidance uh, towards the end, it's sort of a little bit of a synopsis of how these cases are going to be worked up if indeed we do find it in the U.S. and, you know, the epi is really important, some kind of link to an imported animal. Uh, although it doesn't rule out the possibility of, you know, the, the insect vectors getting over here on a ship or something. So, I mean, uh, most likely an imported animal. But and I think that also is going to uh, reflect on how the the uh, follow-up is handled. If if you can pinpoint uh, an imported animal source, maybe there'll be a, a more rigorous attempt to try to stop it in a localized area. But once it gets into the vectors, it's probably going to be a lot like West Nile, where it just mm -hmm. sweeps across. Yes? In relation to the possibility of introduction into North America, any consideration been given to um, passive transfer in containers, shipping containers, in terms of the vector itself, like we saw with Aedes albopictus, with Ocular tatus japonicus, how those two invasive species were first introduced into the U.S. and became established. It's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. If the import-export people are working on establishing those, I have not heard if they're going to take any special measures on trying to... to Anything else on Schmollenberg? Okay, um, I'm going to just quickly go through a couple other cases, and, I'm, and bear with me here. I'm going to go very quickly to try to gain a little time uh, back. From an emerging disease aspect, I'm going to try to focus on a few cases that we have going at NVSL. Some of these are, are not new, but again, just to get you thinking about possible emerging diseases. Last year in April, we had a case... Uh, uh, submitted to the diagnostic lab uh, for possible Q fever testing. Um, it came from a sheep flock in Washington um, who had been reporting problems with abortions for quite some time, actually, since December of 2010. And we did uh, diagnose Q fever in those goats. Interestingly, it was just a matter of a few weeks later when CDC was called in to follow up on an outbreak in humans um, for Q fever. And it, it's just 
something I think that a lot of veterinarians don't keep real high on their list of differentials, but Q fever is definitely alive and well in the U.S., so, um, and it, it goes to show the, the one health aspect of what we're doing. Swine? Yes. And I am from Washington State, so I was very much intimately involved with that. And we uh, we learned an awful lot about Q fever, and it probably answered, it probably created more questions than it actually answered. But it wasn't a goat herd; it was a meat goat herd, and uh, it the the correlation between the blood testing and the the shedding of the virus or of the bacteria was not it wasn't very good. Uh, so we really are in a quandary uh, when we get a blood test back. But I think one thing that really came out was that the human uh, providers are underreporting acute fever as well. There, it, it happens like this time of year when a lot of the goats are at the end of the flu season. A lot of the goats and kids and the sheep might be, be birthing, and they, somebody comes in reporting flu-like symptoms and. Q fever isn't on their radar screen, but I think it is in Washington State, at least in uh -huh. Washington now. <laughs> so. And uh, there was a NALM study as, as well, just recently uh, they did a sheep survey looking for antibodies to Q fever, and I don't, is there anybody from NALMS here from CIA? I don't think that's been published yet, but um, we did the testing at NDSL for that as well, and hopefully that'll increase the awareness a little bit as well. So we see it sporadically in Southern California with sheep and goat subportions. And uh, our diagnostic uh, tool mainly is uh, PCR or immunohistochemistry. Yeah. Yeah. We, we aren't going we are to get excited about it unless we see it in the placenta mm -hmm. and the IHC now, because it's all over the board. Uh, yeah. Whether they're shutting one day and not shutting the next. I think that tighter information will be useful to show kind of distribution and how common it is. Okay, the ELISA doesn't work. From what we see anyway, the ELISA seems to be a much more accurate test, especially a way into the the situation, which is usually where we see it, where, where it brings, comes to our attention that it's a way into the inf inf infection already. Mm -hmm. So the ELISA seems to be a more accurate test for us. On a herd basis, not on an individual animal basis. Right. Even the uh, antibody widespread animals, was in humans in the herds. Okay. And, and again, the sheep study will, I think, give some good baseline indication on just how widespread it is. I don't know that anybody surveyed a lot before that study. So again, we're at NVSL, a lot, a lot to do with avian influenza, uh, or a lot to do with influenza in general, I should say, the swine influenza project uh, along with CDC. Uh, uh, Dr. Trock has spoken about that and will again, I think, so I'm going to kind of skip over that. Um, we're still doing influenza surveillance in wild birds. That's kind of tapered down as funding kind of uh, um, decreased for that. We're still finding quite a bit of influenza and wild birds, lots of different types. It's a very interesting survey of the landscape for that. We're also doing wild bird market surveillance for influenza and uh, Newcastle disease. Okay, uh, a few things in, in DBL that are going on. Again, Matt Erdman's the head. Um, we moved the scrapie genotyping into the mycobacteria and brucella section because they do so much genotyping of TB and brucella isolates. We, uh, we just thought that that molecular type testing fit better within that laboratory. And they've also implemented tissue matching and sex determination for, for sheep. Um, we've harmonized our TB genotyping to match CDCs. We did a peer review and brought somebody up from CDC, and that was a really great uh, interaction and exchange. They gave us a lot of good ideas to how to improve our program, and that's one of the outcomes. We're doing some um, whole genome sequencing of Embovis and Brucella with the ion torrent manufacturing manufacturers. Uh, we've got a couple new proficiency tests coming out. 
uh, one for CEM and then two for salmonella and poultry that are coming out this spring. Uh, we've got lepto training in, May, in uh, late July at Thames. Uh, we've got a new PCR for Campylobacter and a new salmonella assay, a molecular, <laughs> a a molecular serotyping assay for, uh, it's, all, it's quicker and it also uh, helps with, with serotypes that are hard to, uh, to type with conventional methods. Uh, excuse me, what method do you use for serotyping? Or so salmonella. salmonella serotyping, just conventional serum. Oh. Just, uh, and, and this molecular method is being kind of validated side by side. Oh. Uh, we got a paper coming out uh, looking at salmonella uh, antibiotic resistance with a collaborator from Ohio State. Uh, we made some tuberculin and rebottled it. That was due to a, a tuberculin shortage that was happening a couple years ago, but I think since there's uh, another uh, licensed manufacturers online and we're probably going to back away from the tuberculin production at NVSL uh, somewhat anyway. We make a lot of reagents that there's no commercial source for, including Brucella reagents and others. We've got a project looking at uh, the TB Servid stat pack as potentially uh, another official test, and that's a project that's ongoing. We've got a large serum bank with both cervid samples from TB-infected and non-infected animals and uh, bovine-infected and non-infected, and we provide those to industry to help validate uh, new diagnostic tests. Pathobiology Lab, the director, Dr. Art Davis, their bread and butter is TB histopath. They do about 10,000 samples a year, most of it from slaughter surveillance. We also test for um, insect kumafos levels for, from dip tanks at the border, and we're working on a project to look for a possible replacement for kumafos. And we're looking at new platforms for immunohistochemistry along with the Nolan Labs for TSE testing because the current platform is obsolete and is no longer being supported by the company. Uh, another paper coming out uh, is uh, Bruce Thompson's study looking at rectal biopsies in white-tailed deer to diagnose uh, chronic wasting disease. Um, he found an interesting uh, genotypic correlation that some animals with a certain genotype don't, don't show very good sensitivity with rectal biopsy testing. Uh, and that paper should be published sometime in the near future. The Foreign Animal Disease Lab, again, I, I told you about the, the shifts. Um, Dr. Bill White, who was the director, got lured away from FADL to DHS. He still works on Plum Island, uh, but we weren't able to keep him in, in the Foreign Animal Disease Lab. That, that uh, director position is open and will be advertised again in the near future. We've, we've had kind of a struggle keeping that position so if anybody wants a really exciting career turn, <laughs> keep your eye out for, for that uh, announcement. Uh, FADL does a lot of international collaborations, as you would expect. One of the things from an emerging disease standpoint, I just want to point out, uh, there, Haiti had some problems with uh, a disease starting a couple years ago in their swine. Uh, we sent Ming Deng and, and Dave Pyburn from the the AFA swine staff went down, they collected samples, we diagnosed porcine teshin disease, and um, we isolated uh, porcine teshin virus 1, both in Ames and at FADL. The FAO got involved and they wanted to bring in, the only vaccine manufacturer in the world was one from Russia. Uh, Dr. Clifford was really not all that excited about bringing a Russian vaccine. Uh, into the Western Hemisphere uh, with all the um, African swine fever problems they're having over there. So we kind of um, looked for other ways and we cleaned up that, that virus that we got from those pigs. We safety tested it and we worked with uh, an autogenous vaccine manufacturer in the United States and made basically a countrywide autogenous vaccine. And we're, at, we're actually going to deliver that to them uh, next week, and they're going to try some vaccine trials with that vaccine. 
They also, uh, Dave Pyburn hooked them up with a vaccine company here, and they looked at vaccinating for circle virus to see if that would maybe stop the, the Keshen outbreak. Um, but anecdotal reports came back that it, it helped some, but they still were having outbreaks of, of the Teshin disease. So they're really looking forward to getting their hands on that new vaccine. Um, we've done some emerging disease investigations, SEALs up from Alaska, and we were not able to get a definitive diagnosis on this. We ruled out the vesicular diseases, and we've got a, a panviral microarray out at FADL that is, is pretty good at, at picking out viral etiologies of diseases, kind of looking for what could it be instead of specifically ruling out individual diseases. Unfortunately, we haven't had much luck getting good, high-quality samples from these seals, so we don't feel like we have really given that microarray a really good shot in, in this disease investigation keeping our eye on and providing uh, diagnostic support for an outbreak of CSF in Guatemala. There's uh, quite a bit of uh, CSF activity in Central America, and uh, at one time they were looking for a vaccine. I think there might be a, a bit of a vaccine shortage for CSF. Um, just some of the diagnostic work and projects going on, uh, we're, we're working to um, help CVB license a foot and mouth disease pen side lateral flow test. We're working with a uh, DHS funded project to look at uh, PCR in bulk milk tank samples and Dr. Hollinger was talking about this a little bit yesterday. We're also looking at the, the loop mediated amplification assays, the LAMP assays, which are basically a PCR that you can do without a thermocycler, single temperature thing, very rugged tests, very attractive for developing countries. And FADL's actively looking, after, looking into getting those tests online. Again, assay validation, the lateral flow device for Pennside is a big deal, and, and CDB is, it has that presented right now for licensure in the U.S and the bulk tank milk PCR will also be a very valuable tool for us once we get it online. Mike McIntosh is actively combing the world for bulk tank samples from FMD endemic countries, and he's made some good contacts in Pakistan and, and in African countries as well. And just to uh, remind everybody again in VSL, oversees the coordination of the NOM. There's currently, I think, 57 labs in 40 different states in the NOM network. And I think somebody else is going to speak about NOM. Stick through that. Swine Surveillance Project, uh, together with CDC, um, we're actively sequencing uh, swine influenza isolates. We got off to a little bit of a slow start, but I think we're up and running pretty well right now with next generation sequencing. Got some upcoming training, quality management training in Ames in May. Also uh, in May we have VS Memo 580.4, which is the Foreign Animal Disease Diagnostic Procedure. This probably would be training, and I haven't talked to Burke Healy, but uh, he was talking yesterday about continuing education credits for FADDs, and I think this this training would probably fit the bill very well for that because this is one of the things that's needed pretty badly by the field. And a list of our proficiency tests that we have available from NBSL. And first quarter publications, I'm just going to skip through those in a matter of time, websites. <coughs> 